Okay, Isaiah chapter 49, as we continue on through the book of Isaiah, again tonight we will be looking at um, Israel, also called Jacob. It's interesting when you read the story of, of Jacob and, and his life and how it kind of unfolds and God reveals to us through just his name alone, uh, Jacob, meaning surplanter, deceiver, even how he received his, his uh, birthright, even his birth, you know, he, he pulled his brother back in, in a sense, and, and, and tried to take it from him. And Jacob, meaning that deceiver, and then God names him Israel, meaning one ruled by God, under God's control. And in a sense, he, he is controlled by God. At times, he gives in to God. He walks with God. He humbles himself before God. But then there are other times where he's Jacob, and he's not ruled by God. He's deceiving. He's manipulating. He's trying to control his own destiny. And I find that interesting because I find myself in that quite often, where I'm trying to direct God. You know, I'm asking God, if you can do this, and God, if you can do that, then, you know, everything's going to work out, everything will be fine, and not necessarily, Lord, if your will will just be done and I can accept that, then everything truly will be fine because I'll be in your perfect will. And really, that's where we need to be is where we're ruled under God. Now, he's going to use that term here, but he's going to use it for Jesus Christ. And that's interesting because Jesus truly is ruled by God, 100%. He was obedient all the way to the cross. Uh, still dealing with, the, with Babylon, in a sense. This chapter is filled with uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ references. We call them theophanies, if you've heard that word before, or pre-incarnate uh, examples of Christ. We see it in Joshua when uh, the commander of the army of the Lord came to Joshua, and it was literally Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate. Some would even suggest that the burning bush was, was a uh, theophany of Christ himself, speaking to Moses. Uh, you remember when he was re- speaking with the religious leaders and uh, debating over the father Abraham, and he said, before Abraham was, I am. And he used those same words that the bush spoke to Moses. When Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? Uh, to, to the children of Israel there while they were in Egypt, and he said, say, I am has sent you. And so Jesus uses those words. And so a theophany, which tells us what? Jesus is God. He existed before his, his uh, birth into this world. And so our Savior is more than just a man, more than a moral teacher, more than, than just somebody that has good ideas. Uh, he's God in the flesh, and he existed beforehand. So that's wonderful to know that because it brings comfort in the power of our Lord. So let's look at Christ here as he's being sent to the Jews who were complaining in a sense. The first seven verses or so speak about, about Christ. He says, listen, O coastlands. Now in a sense, he's, he's not just directing towards Israel, but, but to everyone, even the Gentiles. You know, Listen to me and take heed, uh, you people from afar. Now take heed... Um, that means listen up, pay attention, uh, hear my words, and, and then do something about it in a sense. And quite often we find ourselves as Christians that we hear his words, we understand his words, but the application aspect is always the difficult part of our walk with Jesus Christ. And yet that is the most important part, is the application to what we know when we hear the word of God, isn't it? Because this book is filled with so much wisdom, so much power for us to live a godly, righteous life. And we can find so much information here about God, uh, what His character is about, what His will is for our lives. And yet, this book can be dull to our hearing, and we don't literally take heed to it. We don't do it. As James would say, be doers of the word and not just hearers only, uh, deceiving yourselves. And so we need to be doers of the word. When, when we hear the word of God, we need to do the word of God. Now, how do I do that? Well, you ask for the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to ask the Lord and just say, Lord, help me to be a doer of the word. H- help me to apply it to my life. So when you tell me to have faith and trust in you, really let me have faith and trust in you. Let me really rest in you. So when these things come up, then I can just say, okay, Lord, you're in control. 
I know you are, and you're going to handle this. I know you will. And so I'm just going to let it go. I'm going to trust in you. I'm just going to continue on in, in working. I'm going to continue on in, in praying and just seeking you and studying and, and just drawing closer to you, and I'm going to let you handle it, Lord. And that's the application. And so we need to pray for the Holy Spirit to, to help us to truly take heed. You people from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, the matrix means from the innermost parts of my mother, he has made mention of me. Now, wait a minute. Did I skip? I did, didn't I? Okay, I did it. Okay. I wasn't sure that for a second. Um, okay, so he's talking about the innermost parts that he was in his mother's womb. We know from Micah 5.2 says, Bethlehem Ephraim, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler of Israel, who's going forth is from old and from everlasting, speaking of Jesus Christ, prophesied before he, he came into the world. And so... Uh, Jesus here is setting up the scene that, that I was in the beginning and I am everlasting and I come from the innermost parts of God's plans. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadows of his hand he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver. He has hidden me. Now that's an interesting statement there. Uh, first of all, uh, sharp sword, speaking of the words of the Messiah, having power, having authority. So we can believe what Jesus says. There's also a reference to Revelation, right, where, where he speaks like with a sword from his mouth. But that the fact that here, that he's made like a polished shaft in his quiver, he has hidden me. That possibly may ha be a reference to the fact of Jesus' lost time from his, what, 12 years old when we last read about him in the temple when his mother and father were looking for him, and then all of a sudden he's 30-something years old. And, and there's no record of what happened with him. And some have suggested that here in Isaiah he's making a reference to the fact that Jesus was somewhere hidden and, and he was being polished, uh, he was being ready for whatever was going to come at the time through him. So now what he was doing, I have no idea. I mean, there have been uh, people that have suggested that uh, he went to other places and were ministering. They've even made movies about how he, he was possibly uh, doing things like healing and, and various things in other places, being revealed to, to, to other nations and so forth. But we really don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Uh, we know that there's a gap there and he's nowhere to be found in scriptures. Uh, so we just trust that uh, he was doing something. And so it could be that God was just preparing him. In a sense, kind of like uh, Saul, right? When Saul first be became a Christian, uh, after seeing the Lord and hearing his voice, you know, he went away and he was prepared before he went to the disciples uh, for a while. And he says to me, verse 3, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. So God, speaking of Jesus Christ, uh, will glorify himself in him. Again, O Israel is a reference to not Israel, but to the Messiah here who is ruled by God. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. And so the Messiah's work in the Lord. Uh, I think of Hebrews chapter 1 in, in that scene with God speaking to God. You know, uh, the Father and the Son and having that relationship. And, and Jesus, uh, the Father saying, you have the scepter in your hand. It's the work of Jesus Christ in his life. Uh, a beautiful work and only a work that, that Jesus could do, that God could do, and no man could, could really do in saving us from our sins. Now we come to verse 5, and he speaks concerning uh, some gracious promises to, to the Gentiles. Now the Jews... The Jews would read this, and they would read scriptures that speak about the Gentiles. Now, they did not understand it the way that we understand it today. We know that Jesus went to the Jews, the Jews rejected him, and so then he sends Paul to the, to the Jews. 
I'm, I'm sorry, to the Gentiles. Peter goes to the Jews. And he sends Paul to the Gentiles. Now we understand that because Jesus said that the, the Israelites rejected him. So he has another people that he's going to send the gospel to. And that's the time of the Gentiles. Now the Jews look at it from a different perspective. They look at it as, as the Jews need to proselyte the Gentiles. They need to reach the Gentiles and cause them to become Jews, Jude, become a part of the Jewish system. You know, in, in a sense. And so when they read this about Gentiles, they're thinking they need to get them and bring them into uh, the Jewish system and not understanding that God had the church that he was going to, to build. So I find it interesting that God sent Paul to the Gentiles, you know, because um, I, I, and I, I think the reason is that he sent him to the Gentiles is because the Jews wouldn't receive him. Uh, you know, first of all, Paul knew all the religious leaders, right? Because he was one of the religious leaders. And so it's always hard, like Jesus said, to minister to your own household because they reject you. And so it was perfect for God to call Paul to the Gentiles who didn't know Paul. And so uh, Paul could go to them with all of this Jewish wisdom and knowledge and reach them because they don't know him and they can see his life and it makes sense where Peter could go to the Jews because he really didn't know the leadership in, in a sense that he, he, he spent time with them and worked with them and so forth. You know, I'm sure that he saw them around and things like this, being a fisherman, but he was just a fisherman. And there was a challenge there. Here is a Jewish fisherman speaking to us religious leaders. And so it wasn't necessarily, let's just reject him, but look at what God has done through him. You know, and so they were amazed at Peter. And it's just amazing how God calls people to do specific things. He knows uh, how to raise up men and put them in the places that they need to be. You know, God has a way of doing that so that they can reach. I remember I was talking to a, a pastor. He was a Hispanic guy, Mexican, little short, short guy, looked Mexican, total Mexican, okay? And, and so I was asking him, uh, the pastor's kind of, so, so where are you at? He goes, oh, my pastor in Germany. I'm like, Germany? What are you doing in Germany? He goes, yeah, that's what I ask myself. What am I doing in Germany? And I'm ministering to Germans, you know, and we have a church and it's growing. Like, that is so strange to have a Mexican ministering to Germans, you know, out there. And so God just, just knows, you know, he knows where to send people uh, completely. He says in verse 5, Now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be a servant. Again, speaking of Jesus. To bring Jacob back to him, speaking of Israel, uh, bring back Israel into that relationship with God so that Israel is gathered to him, for I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And so even Jesus trusted in God to be his strength. There was one scripture that I think it's in Hebrews where, where it says that he learned obedience through the sufferings, that is Christ, you know, through the sufferings he learned obedience. Christ himself, not that he would not be obedient. Uh, I think God, Jesus was totally obedient, but I believe he was tempted. I believe that there was um, those temptations of doubts, those temptations of concerns, those temptations of worries and, and various things like that. You see it in the garden when he's sweating, you know, blood, you know, asking the Father to take the cup from him. So he was tempted, but yet he was obedient unto the very end. And he found that strength in the Lord. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nations abhor, to the servants of rulers, kings shall see and rise. Princes shall, or also shall worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in that day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. Notice it says, you as a covenant. It's not that he will make a covenant. You know what a covenant is. It's different than a contract. 
a contract is between you and an individual and you write up the contract in a sense and you're bound legally to fulfill that contract where a covenant is is more of a oath that you are going to commit from your heart and in in all manner of ways to fulfill that covenant between you it's everlasting and in a sense he's saying here that jesus is our covenant he himself is our covenant Uh, there was a covenant made between abraham uh, and god right you remember that covenant that was made and uh, jewish custom was when you made a covenant or a contract with somebody you would take some animal and you would you would uh, uh, slaughter it, and then you would divide it, and you would split it, and then you would both walk between the animals, and it signified that this is our agreement, and it's agreed through this uh, animal that has been sacrificed. And we know that through the scriptures that God literally put at Abraham to sleep. He fell asleep, and God literally walked right through the animal himself and said, I will keep the covenant, because Abraham, you can't keep that covenant. And so Jesus is our covenant and he will keep it. So what does, that, what does that say to us? Is that we can't even keep our promises to Jesus Christ. And yet he is our covenant. And he's faithful to keep every promise that he has towards us. And so if we have become believers by faith in Christ Jesus, then we have a covenant with him and that we will one day sit in heaven with him. And that's a covenant. That's sure. He's not lying. It's not something that he will break. You're already sitting in that place, Ephesians tells us, in the heavenly places. And so we can believe him because he's fulfilling that covenant himself. It has nothing to do with us. It's all his work. And I love it because it's nothing to do with me. It's all what he has done already for me as an inheritance. I think that this specific time here of covenant is probably speaking of the cross. When he died upon that cross and he gave his life and gave his spirit up unto the Lord. And it was that at that time that that covenant was sealed. And so that you may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the roads and their pastures shall be on all desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of the water, he will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road, and my highways shall be elevated. Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west, and these from the land of Sim. Now, Sim may be Egypt. Others identify it with um, China. And so the idea is that that God is going to bring back all those that were in captivity, all that were far off, um, bring them back into that covenant relationship that he had. Now verse 13, as he speaks about God's uh, perpetual love. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break out in singing, O mountain. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. You know, when when Israel was in bondage, it's hard for us to understand what they were going through. Maybe some of you might understand uh, when you go through difficulties and you have to move uh, from a situation and and move maybe even cities or locations, and and it's hard to leave. Uh, Like, you know, I have, we have our house right now. You know, we had everybody over. I love my house. I'm blessed to even have that house, you know, and I love using it for the Lord. Uh, I love people there. I love, you know, I was thinking the other day that I had to get Roman to get all these other Calvaries and have like a volleyball thing and swimming thing with uh, East Vale and Living Water and, you know, Refuge and just get all the youth kids out there and just, you know, have a, have a good time. And so I was thinking about that and then how Israel was literally taken from their land you know, their, their temple destroyed and moved, you know, and, and assimilated with other nations and groups and just kind of became a mishmash of, of people, you know, from all over the place. And I was thinking, how would I feel if, you know, if my wife is, is telling me we're going to move and she is, <laughs> she wants me to move, you know, it's like, I don't want to leave my house. I like my house. 
You know, I don't want to leave it and start all over again. I'm comfortable, you know. Uh, I know it. I know where everything is at. I know where all the lines, where the sprinklers are, are laying, you know. I know you don't dig there. And, you know, just all of those things. I'm very comfortable there. And then all of a sudden to be moved. That's hard to do. Uh, when we moved from Roland Heights to Redlands because I got a job out in Palm Springs. That was hard to do because we had no family out there. So there we are way out there alone. And that was really difficult uh, to be alone. So imagine your parents and grandparents and your children and your cousins all being taken and moved out of their land. That's a hard thing to uh, endure. And then God's saying rejoice. Rejoice. Be happy. You know, be glad. Well, how can you be glad and happy and rejoice in situations like that? That is where our faith is tested, isn't it? When we go through things, when things aren't as easy, when we are being afflicted. You know, I always remember this, and it it helps me to get through it. I don't deserve any of it anyway. I don't deserve any good I deserve the pit of hell because I have sinned against God and I truly do deserve to be separated from Him for eternity. And so if He's allowing me to go through these things and yet I still have eternal salvation, then I can rejoice in that, that my name is written in the book of life. That's what He told the disciples. They came back jumping up and down, demons, miracles, signs and wonders, you know, and and they're just so happy. And Jesus said, why are you guys rejoicing? Well, because everybody was in subjection to our words, you know. And we saw miracles and signs and demons were running with their tails between their legs, you know. It's like, wow, that's exciting. And Jesus said, no, don't, don't rejoice over that because that's going to come and go, right? You're not going to always have healings. You're not always going to be victorious over the, the enemy. Rejoice over this. Your names are written in the book of life. You're going to heaven. You have a place there. This isn't your place. Your sojourners, don't hang on to it. Don't hang on to the things that are here. Don't hang on to the people that are here. It's all going to pass. I was talking to a pastor um, the other day. Uh, we, were at, we were at a, a meeting just Tuesday. And um, he started a ministry out in Corona. And he's just telling me how sweet it is. He goes, ah, the people are sweet. And, and people are sweet. I'm not saying they're not. <laughs> he goes, and there's, you know, we just a tiny little church, and we all love each other. We all go out to dinner with one another. You know, we do family things together, and it's like it's just really nice. And I'm like, yeah, it is nice. Huh? <laughs> you know, and and, and then I kind of says, oh, wait till you grow. <laughs> wait till you grow, because uh, then you're gonna realize that they're not your people. They're God's people. And God has plans for your people. And then I shared with him how uh, about a year and a half ago we had a big split. And these were people that were with me from almost the beginning. The beginning of this church. That we had relationships. That we, that we uh, wed their children and, and baptized them. And, and were at personal events and, and, and so forth. And spent a lot of time in their homes. And, and, you know, and then... They left. And I didn't mean split, but they left. God called them away. And he warned me that it would happen. Because they're not our people. Yeah, it's nice to have a sweet church. And everybody's sweet. And and we're fellowshipping. And that's what we should do. But we shouldn't hold on to each other so tightly. Because you're not my people. You're God's people. And any moment, God can say, I want you to, to leave. And he can. And I have no say in that whatsoever. That's up to God, you know, and what He wants to do in your life. And I have seen people even leave this place in a bad way and go somewhere else and be fine. They learn. There was a guy that um, that uh, came here, and I should have known right off, but it, almost immediately he was bad mouthing his pastor to where he came from, just about uh, how he's unreachable. I can't get a hold of him when he needs him. And, and then started talking about his teaching. And I'm, in my mind, I'm just thinking, okay, okay, this, he's young. Hopefully he'll learn here. You know, I can teach him. You know, we don't put our eyes on those things. You know, we just trust in God and, and so forth. And I was really hoping for that. But he just came out of that situation and he came here. And I, and I was hoping for that. Well, then he started doing that here. He started doing that here. 
And, and so, um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't stand for it. So he ended up leaving here, going somewhere else, and he's fine where he's at. So it, it took him a transition of leaving a bad situation that he felt was bad, and, and he was still hurting when he came here and, and had to work through all that, and then he finally was finding some healing, and now he's somewhere else, and he's fine there. In fact, he's an even an assistant pastor. You know, and sometimes people have to go through those transitions of healing and growth. And you're talking a period of four or five years. You grow a lot in those years. You know, and I would hope, I remember listening to, um, what's the guy, McDowell that comes on, on in the morning on the radio. And, uh, he was saying that people don't change, so be careful um, who you raise up in leadership because people don't change. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, we're supposed to change though, aren't we? Aren't we supposed to heed the word of God? Aren't we supposed to grow in our, our Christianity? Aren't we, to, aren't we supposed to let go of the childish things and mature in Christ Jesus? I mean, we're supposed to grow. You know, and so I hope that you change and I hope you don't stay the same. I hope I don't stay the same. I hope that I grow. I think I've grown in, in these past 19 years a lot compared to when, when I first started this ministry. But we have to realize... We're, you're not my people, and I'm not your, you know, necessarily your personal pastor, you know. I have a position here and a place, a calling, and that's all it is, and I have to be faithful to it. And if God's calling you here, then you have a specific task and, and a reason for being here, and you have to be faithful to it, right? That's how it works. You're called here. I hope you're called here. Uh, if if not, then you are really governing your own life. You're not ruled by God. You're not Israel. You're Jacob. And you're making your own decisions. Uh, make them with God and, and let God lead you. And then he's going to lead you to the right place, the right time. And God will begin to mature you. you know. And we need to be patient with one another. So, So just trusting in God. Even in those afflictions, we can rejoice that he's in total control. It's not always easy when you're going through it, though, is it? And Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. Now, we've all felt that before. Where's God? I don't feel Him. I think He's left me. Um, when I went to Israel, uh, we had our, our tourist guide with us. His name was Yossi. Great guy. Oh, man. I, I wish I had the knowledge that he had of the New Testament or even the Bible itself. Because he does this every single day, you know, he knows the New Testament because he's going to all these sites and he's quoting scriptures and so forth. So um, while I was with him, I wanted to witness him because I heard that he wasn't a believer. And so I wanted to witness because I had uh, just learned that Ray Comfort thing, you know, if you lie and if you steal type of thing. I'm like, this got to work on him. And I even talked to Bob Probert a, a little bit about it. I'm going to witness to him. And Bob says, be careful. <laughs> just be careful. And so I just, I, I just started talking to him about it. And then he brought up uh, uh, this fact. He, he got his face turned red and he got angry. And, and basically what he said, where was God during the Holocaust? And I went like, whoa, I'm like, I could feel, you know, his, his anger and his frustration that God wasn't there, you know, and that was me. And I'm just, and immediately I went to say, there's a purpose for that. And he even got worse because how can you say six million Jews have a purpose of dying, you know? And I'm, so I just backed off. I just completely backed off. People feel that God has abandoned them. The Jews feel that God has abandoned them. And when we go through things, we feel that God has abandoned us, right? Where are you, God? Because you're not doing what I want you to do. <clears throat> but He's right there by you doing what He knows is best for you. Because it will work out something greater. Because you're a diamond. You know, and diamonds will grow and, and get brilliant by the pressure that it's under. And to him, you guys are all diamonds and he's working these things out in your life. Don't, don't forget, he's always with you. He even said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will always be there for you. Even when you're crying out, where are you, Lord? He's right there. And, and you can take that to the bank. Can a woman forget her nursing child? And now he, he kind of tries to expound on this, you know. Uh, can a woman forget her nursing child? Well, okay, yeah. I mean, okay, 
maybe there's a case there where a woman can kind of just forget their nursing child, but what he's saying there is no. Normally, a mother will not forget its child and not have compassion on the son of her womb. Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. The walls are reference to Jerusalem. Your, your name, your face, your picture is on the palm of God's hands. He sees you all the time. And it's not, it's not one of these, you see those movies and they're looking for someone, they got a picture of the guy right here on his wrist, right? And they're like, oh, that's what he looks like, let's go get him. You know, or who they're looking for. No, God isn't trying to get you. He's got you on the palm of his hands because he's holding you. He's watching out for you. Neat that our names are written on his palm. It's how much he loves us. <clears throat> when I was in high school, I sat right behind Virginia in one of my classes in, I think it was ninth grade. We weren't, we weren't dating yet. It was the beginning of the ninth year, and I used to play with her hair. Well, it was kind of laying on my desk there, you know, because the desks were like really close, and she didn't even know it, you know, so I'd touch her hair. Weird, huh? <laughs> and then I would take, I would look at her, her peachy folder, you know, and um, see all the scribbles and stuff like that, and then I'd write her name on my, on my hand, you know, because we met in junior high, and we had gone study in junior high, if you want to call it that. So we already knew each other, and now there she is sitting in front of me. And I'd write her name on my on my palm and have it right there, because I loved her. Even at that age, you know, and though I didn't know what love was, and I'm not suggesting you do that at all, young lady. <laughs> you know, but I did. I, I, I really loved her and to this day, you know. Um, I, and I would put her name on my palm. You know, a sign that she was with me all the time, in a sense, you know, and that's what God does with us. Um, think about the nails in His hands that He allowed them to to put through His hands for you, yeah. so that He could hang on the cross and take your sins. That's how much He loves us. Your sons shall make haste, your destroyers and those who lay you waste shall go away from you. I'm going to take care of you. Um, those that try to come up against you, I'll watch out for you. Lift up your eyes, look around and see all these gather together and come to you. As I live, saith the Lord, you shall surely clothe yourself with them all as an ornament and bind them on you, on you as a bride does for your waste and desolate places and the land of your destruction will even now be too small for the inhabitants. And those who swallow you up will be far away. The children you will have after you have lost the others will say again in your ears, the place is too small for me. Give me a place where I may dwell. Then you will uh, say in your heart, who has begotten these for me since I have lost my children and am desolate, a captive, a wandering to and fro. And who has brought these up? There I was, left alone. But these were, were they. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift my hand in an oath to the nations and set up my standards for the people. They shall bring your sons in their arms, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you and their faces to the earth, and lick up the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. Now, this is a reference to the Jews that one day... The world will cater to them. The kings will take care of them. This is why the Israelites believed that they were going to rule and reign and God was going to be their king. They were going to rule the world. And so when Jesus came along and claiming to be the Messiah, they thought he was going to set this up now like Isaiah was saying. This is where now it gets set up. Jesus will conquer them. And the Jews will rise to power and we will no longer be under the, the reign of the Roman Empire, but they'll be catering to us. For eternity. That's what they were looking for and that's what they thought. But that's not what he was speaking about. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty? Or the captivity of the righteous be delivered? 
But thus says the Lord, even the captivities of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible will be delivered. For I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with sweat, sweet wine. All flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob." God will help them. God will take care of them, even their children. You know, I have four boys. And I adopted one who's in the Air Force right now. The four blood boys I raised up uh, as they were little in the Lord, literally in the Lord they didn't have a lot of time in the world. And so I really drilled into them Christianity. I mean, I questioned their walk constantly. And they did something wrong. Said, That's what a Christian does? Is that how a Christian acts? Because you're not acting like a Christian. And you better make sure that you're a Christian. And, and so I made them understand that it's important to, to have the fruit of a Christian. And... It's hard to talk about them because they're all here almost <laughs> in this church. But one of my boys was, was a little rebellious, a lot rebellious. Um, and his mother and I had to really trust in the Lord. We really had to trust in the Lord that God was going to do his work in him. And so God had to work in him, even from high school, because that's where he really started to get a little rebellious in situation. I mean, we, we would literally take him, uh, something would happen, we would grab his hand, I'd grab his hand and take him to the house and he'd have to apologize to the parents and the kids and everything. I mean, that's how I was. I mean, I'm like, you're not getting away with nothing. If I found some substance, it was like, call the police, they're coming down right now and just scare them to death. You know, um, just type of stuff. You know, but we had to let him go and give him to God. And there are a lot of parents that can't do that. It's hard for them to do that. To just let go of their children and know that God loves them more than you do. That's a hard thing to do, especially for, for mamas. You know, to let go of their child, uh, it's hard. And so you want to protect them as much as you can. We just love them. You know, I didn't always love them. I, I could remember one time with him, we got in a big old argument. We almost started throwing, when well, we did, we threw some fists around you know, and, and, and stuff like that. And, and the Lord had to show me some things and, and, and so forth. But it was neat because he, he left and, and God ministered to him. And he would always come back. And they always do. They always come back. You know, and you just open up your house in love and in Christ. And you continue to love them in Christ. And he came back, and, and it was always with repentance that you, you were right. <laughs> you were right. You know, and I'm rebellious, you know, and I need to stop this and that and this and that, you know. If we just leave them to God. Now, I'm not saying, you know, it's like, okay, get out of here. I'm leaving you to God. No, I'm saying you do as much as you can. Obviously, legally, you have a right until they're 18. But ultimately, you have to leave them to God knowing that God will take care of him. And that's what he's saying here. I will take care of your children. I love them just as much as you love them. I will watch over them. You don't have to fear you know, about them. And, and if they do die, and, and many children do die, you know that they're in heaven. You know they go to be with the Lord. And there's comfort in that. Let's go to the next chapter. Chapter 50. We'll finish up with this beautiful chapter. We see Christ in this chapter. Thus says the Lord, where's the certificate of your mother's divorce? Whom have I put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? For your iniquity you have sold yourselves. And for your transgressions your mother has been put away. Now he continues with that thought, you know, you've left us, you're not here. Look at, we're in captivity. Look at what's going on in my life. You know, where are you, God? And so God now is, is, is saying here, so you think I don't care about you? And then let me ask you, where's the certificate of divorce? Prove that I've divorced you. 
Prove that I want nothing to do with you. Show me it. Show it to me. You know, let there be somebody that stands up and, and tells me that I'm still not here. Because I'm here. Because I'm your God. Because I care. Because I love you. You prove it to me that I don't. And that's what God's doing to them. You know, you watch and see that I am here. Because he loves them. For God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He loves the world. He He loves even those that are unbelievers. He loves them. It saddens him to know and to see many of them going to hell. It saddens him. He doesn't want that to happen because he loves them so much. But they won't. What happens is that because of their own sins, their own inequities, uh, they are reaping what they sowed, right? Is basically what's happening. They're reaping what they sowed. And Israel's in that place. They got into idolatry. They fell into the culture, the system. They rejected God. They were worshiping other idols. They were trusting these things. And God says, you are reaping what you've sowed. And you think I've left you, when in reality, you have left me. You have left me. And and I really believe that oftentimes when we start feeling that, it's because we have left him. When I was hurt, um, it was hard for me to read the Bible. Because you're in so much pain with that sciatic nerve and the piriformis uh, squeezing on the sciatic nerve because the, the... the nerve will literally either run through it, that muscle, or it will run around it. And if that piriformis shrinks or tugs on the sciatic, it's just like a pain going down your whole side. And it doesn't matter how much uh, narcotics you take. <laughs> you know, It just hurts. And there's no way you can read. I mean, I, I just could not read. I had to lay there and not find a place that just hurt less and not move from that place. You know, And take Percocet after Percocet, hoping that it just go away. And it's hard for you to read. And then you start asking, where are you, God? Where are you, God? And in reality, you're not seeking Him through reading. You're not seeking Him to pray. You're just saying, where are you? Why aren't you doing something about this? And we've left Him. We're not seeking Him. We're not trusting in Him. In reality, we are reaping what we're sowing. Think about that. Think about what you're going through and and how you have sown certain things in your life. You need to go back and repent. You need to go back and say, I'm sorry. You need to change and do the right things and then begin to reap good fruit in that situation. Why when I came there was no man? Why when I called there was none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Indeed, with my rebuke I dry up the sea and make the rivers a wilderness Their fish stink because there is no water and die of thirst. Again, you think I'm gone? Where's your evidence? Is my arm too short that I can't deliver? Of course, those are rhetorical questions. No, 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 you are God. You're strong, you're powerful, you have authority, you can deliver. Uh, We have not because we ask not, because we don't seek the Lord. We need to ask. I was always afraid to ask my dad for things. Because my dad was one that uh, was angry a lot. And so I couldn't ask him for things all the time. But every once in a while I would, I would take time and, and just think about how I was going to ask him. <laughs> you know, and it is interesting that he had power and authority. That he could do things. And if I asked in the right way, he would literally you know, help me out in that situation. I remember when Virginia and I moved out here to this area, we were in, in Redlands, and then we wanted to buy a house out here. And so it was hard for us to to ask for a cosigner. And so I finally got the nerve, and I asked my dad if he would cosign. And he said, yeah. And so he had that authority. You know, he, his arm was in short, and he helped us, and we were able to, to purchase the house uh, that we live in now. Because he co-signed for us. You know. And so God's the same way. You know, he hasn't divorced us. His arm is not shortened. You know, he has the authority. And if we ask, he can help us. He wants to help us. You know, he, he's dried up the sea for the children of Israel when he's against their backs. And they needed help at that very moment. You know, he can do that at any time. 
I clothe the heavens <laughs> with blackness. There's more evidence. And I make sackcloth their covering. Just look at the heavens itself. It's beautiful. We'll be going up to Bishop July, and I just can't wait to just look up at the stars. It's so black, and they're just billions upon billions of stars. It's beautiful. And God did it all. He can do that, then He can help me. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, the man who will stand up for Israel, that I should know how to speak, a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. Now he's speaking there of the Messiah, giving the Messiah every detail concerning the crucifixion, every word that he is to speak, everything that he is to do. The Lord God has opened my ears and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. And so the example is Jesus Christ, right? We call ourselves Christians because we're to be Christ-like. The word Christian came about from the enemies of Christ. It really was a word of... uh, demeaning the believers in Jesus Christ. They would literally, like a slang or a cuss word, say those are Christians, they're Christ-like. They're no good for nothing. And now we use the word Christ-like as a good thing. But it really uh, is a word that came from the enemy to accuse us of being like Christ. And yet here we are calling ourselves many who call themselves Christians and are not Christ-like at all, at all. And it's sad. Jesus is our, is, is our example completely. And he says, I wasn't rebellious at all. I was obedient completely. And he's referring here to a bondservant, to a slave who would give his ear, you know, uh, and they would stick a hole in it and a ring to signify that I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. That's what Jude said, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, a brother of James. You know, a bondservant, freely giving myself to God completely. They were to serve for six years. That was their term of slavery. And they served uh, gladly the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, when he prayed in the garden, he prayed, not my will be done, but your will be done in obedience to God, the Father, to the cross. He says, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheek to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Here's an example and a reference to the whole crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Gave his back, his cheeks, his back that was whipped with those those cords of either glass or lead that would open up his, his back and tendons and tissue and muscle and, and blood and so forth. His cheeks that were, were um, beaten when they put that bag over his, his head and, and they would hit him in the face and his, he gave his cheeks for us. Um, it's one thing to, to throw a blow at someone who's coming at you without a bag and they see you because they, can, you know, they have that reflex. You know, they'll move. And we all have a, a, a natural reflex. When we see things, we move fast. If, if we see something in a corner of our eye, we move out of the way. It's a natural thing. And, and boxers develop that, right? They develop that. They train so that when they see anything, they're going to cushion that blow. They're going to turn so that it misses or it barely skins and, and, and so forth. And you get less of that impact, that power hitting, and you don't get injured as much. You know, you can get in a car accident and the same thing. You're in a car accident. Most people will stiffen up trying to think that they're going to ride it out. If you just let your body go, you'll probably survive better than if you're trying to hold it all together. It's just a natural instinct. But put a sack over your your face, you know, and there's, the guards are right there in front of you and you can't see and all of a sudden a fist comes. You're just, you know, standing there and your head's not moving and boom, you're taking a full blow. And that's painful. You might as well hit a wall or jump out of a plane and hit the water, you know, straight on, face first, you know. He gave his cheeks. Uh, here's a reference to plucking of the beard. We don't see that in the New Testament anywhere written, but here Isaiah says that they literally took his beard and they plucked it out. <clears throat> uh, 
I, um, <clears throat> you have to hate somebody to do that. You have to be accustomed to, to hurting people and have this numbness to do something like that to an individual. I'm sure they plucked a lot of beards. You know, guys that were prisoners and and just grabbing their head and you know just yanking their beard right out of their face, and that's what they did to Jesus. You know, we, we think about this whole thing about Jesus and and all that He did for us. I mean, His great love and so forth, and the evidence is there, and He He proved it and so forth. I mean, we we, we shouldn't even ask, "Do you love me?" Because it's obviously it's it's so clear what He has done for us. Even the spitting of it, the shame of it as they spit on him and mocked him and, and, and so forth. Um, but yet, that pain and that suffering wasn't really the work that he did. The real work was the death on the cross when sin was laid upon him, the separation of the Father, and he once and for all dealt with sin and gave us victory over it. The guy that was uh, the ambassador for Benghazi, I believe it is, uh, those guys that the Muslims went in there and they, they took the guys and, and killed them. And there was a big controversy over why we didn't do anything about it. Uh, it's coming out now and <clears throat> that uh, they literally took that guy, Christopher, the ambassador. They took him while he was alive and they beat him up. They took cattle prods and they were poking him with these cattle prods in his groin. They have pictures of this in the newspapers over there. We won't show them here for some reason. I don't know why. They won't show them here. Uh, they would toss him in the street back and forth, drag him all over the place. Um, they even suggested that he was raped. And then they killed him. You have to be wicked to do something like that. And they're all rejoicing and jumping up and down. And then we get this situation where Obama is going to trade five great terrorists for a deserter. Now, for me, because I know God is a compassionate, loving God and gracious God, I can understand trying to get even a deserter out of there. But to give five terrorists, there, there's something going on there. They're saying that one of these terrorists, uh, before, uh, he would do his, his prayers. He would get on his knees and face east, and he would do his prayers. He would literally take infidels and cut their heads off and put them before him while he did his prayers. And you have to be sick to do something like that, you know? I mean, you have to be sick. And then to think that God is okay with that, that type of stuff, you know? And we see Jesus here, prophesied by Isaiah exactly what he would go through. The beating on the back, as Mark 15 tells us. The hitting in the face, Luke 22. Uh, how they covered his face and, and so forth. The mocking and the spitting, Mark 15. All of that that he did, the plucking out of the beard. Because he loved us. And in fact, it says he gave his back to them. He gave it. It wasn't something they took. He willfully gave it to them, knowing what they would do to him. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint. And I know that I will not be ashamed. That's the attitude that we have to have. My God will help me. Well, did God help Jesus? Did he stop the beatings? Did he stop the spitting? Did he stop the, you know, the hitting? No. Did he stop the mocking and all that? Did he stop the cross? Did at one point did he say, hey, that's enough. You know, stop doing that to my son. No. No, he got him through. And then he did his work. And then he resurrected in a new body. And it's done once and for all. And it's never going to happen again. So yeah, in a sense, God helped him ultimately in the end. And we have to look at the end. Because that's where our hope is. The resurrected body, this life that we live is pain and suffering because we live with the flesh and we live with the enemy. And there will always be a battle with the flesh and the enemy. Whether it's the enemy who, who starts the flesh or whether it's, whether it's the flesh that just blows up, you know, and it just causes us problems. As Paul said, those things that I wish 
that I don't do, I find myself doing. And the things that I know I shouldn't be doing, I find myself doing. What is wrong, this wretched body of mine? But thank be to God, through Christ Jesus, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we have to look to the future. God helped him, but not to stop the things, because a work had to be done. And a work has to be done in your life. And in the person's life that you're dealing with, in the work that you're dealing with, in the finances, and in this world, and what God is doing in this world. And ultimately, we trust in God. And we, what? Obey Him. Because it says here that He set, I have set my face like a flint. In other words, I was determined to be obedient to God. I didn't waver at all. I was faithful to Him. And He was all the way to the cross. He is near who justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fear the Lord? Who obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord, and rely upon his God. Look, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with sparks. Walk in the light of your fire, and in the sparks you have kindled. This you shall have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. Now he's giving a contrast there. He's saying, look, you either trust in the Lord, rely on him, or you do your little idols. Light your little sparklers and run around in circles and do your little offerings. And you know what? You're going to lie down and you're going to be tortured. So it's up to you. What do you want to do? And for us today, what he would say is, trust in me. I'm doing a work in your life. Don't trust in yourselves. Don't trust to get deliverance from anywhere else. Trust in me and I will deliver you because I love you. Because your name is inscribed on the palm of my hand. 